George, I think we'll start moving forward here. I think it's uh, 225 and uh, we will uh, move forward with the next session here. Sounds good, John. Thank you very much. And, yeah. and again, thanks thanks to our sponsors, Rapivita, for helping to uh, make this summit uh, possible. Uh, this next session is a great follow-on to what we just uh, listened to from the previous uh, groups. Uh, this, this deals with fleet movement. It's another app for transportation planners and decision makers. Uh, in, in this session, we're going to learn a little bit about this new app and, and how it was tested in the 2020 hurricane season by the All Hazards Consortium, by the private sector-led uh, sensitive information sharing environment, which, by the way, if, if, if you aren't part of that uh, SICE group, uh, towards the end of today's uh, track, I think there's going to be a little bit of a video to, uh, to discuss that. You really would be uh, doing a great service to your company to participate in the SICE working group. You're going to get the information uh, from, from a number of industry experts as to what they do there, best practices, lessons learned, and that sort of thing. Uh, and it, it's, a great, it's a great tool. So, so their, their effort to expedite the movement of private sector repair fleets, resources, the supply chain issues that we all experienced during COVID across multiple state borders following uh, declared disasters. So our speakers today would be uh, Carrie Trapasso, GIS Manager for Bent Ear Solutions, and Bethany Elliott, State Private Sector Liaison from the Alabama Emergency Management Agency. And I pass it along to uh, our speakers. Yeah, give me a second, Carrie and Bethany, and I'll stop sharing and uh, we'll move the uh, capability to you guys. Carrie, do you have the sharing capability yet? Um, I do. I think Bethany was going to drive um, okay. through the slideshow. But I can if, if we can't get that going. Can you tell Bethany if uh, you can share your screen? I believe I can. At the bottom. It'll let you know that if you can or not. Let me find the... Somehow the PowerPoint just left me. <laughs> Carrie, you want to go ahead with your introduction and I'll get that going. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So while she's pulling that up, just a real quick intro about me. Um, my name is Carrie Trapasso. I'm the GIS manager for Bent Ear Solutions. Um, prior to that, I had um, several years of both pi private and public sector um, GIS experience. I've been doing GIS and lots of diff different disciplines for 22 plus years. So I've been in this realm um, a long time and this was a really exciting project to work on and it really showed um, how both private and public can work together and get a job done. Okay, I'm still having a little bit of trouble. Maybe we've got it. Okay, okay I am Bethany, across, Kelly, Bethany. The Alabama Emergency Management Agency. I work in the Office of Executive Operations, reporting directly to our EOO. During emergency activations, I serve as the Critical Infrastructure Support Branch Director for Overnight Operations, which is a fancy way of saying I work second shift. I am also currently wearing the hat of state private sector liaison. That's a new gig for me. I started that literally a week after COVID blew up in Alabama. So I've been learning on the fly. Through that role, I was introduced to the All Hazards Consortium, got involved with the SICE working groups, kind of, I think, interjected myself into the fleet working group and had the opportunity to give a little input into this 
the creation of this application. That was a very minor role. I just basically gave them a, a little bit of insight from the state perspective, but I was proud to be able to be a small part of it. And we will get started. All right, so I'm gonna kick it off here and talk a little bit about um, the All Hazards Consortium and a work group within the All Hazards Consortium, which is the multi-state fleet response work group. So this work group was formed to help address um, many different issues, but their main issue is expediting the movement of private sector fleets across multiple states. So basically when there's a hurricane or when there's a winter storm and the lights go out, poles fall down, um, fleet are moved from the north to the south, the south to the north, east, west, etc., cetera, um, to help out those organizations and those utilities where the disaster has struck. Um, so the work group, uh, that's the problem that they were solving is, is how best to look at this. So the work group brings together both public and private sector representatives um, to, to look at these issues and identify um, ways to address those issues. And so the work group has developed several different operational tools and resources to support the power and supply chain restoration. So again, the main objective of this work group is when disaster strikes and the power goes off, what do we do to get the people there the quickest and get the lights back on the fastest? And as you can imagine, depending on the situation, depending on the disaster, that can prove to be quite challenging. So we're gonna talk about in the presentation today, um, some of those challenges and then an application um, that we're gonna briefly show just how this application has started to address some of those issues. So I'm gonna turn it over to Bethany and we'll show you the app a little later. Thanks, Carrie. So through working with the group, I learned that a lot of the movement issues for the fleets had to, to do with a lack of knowledge, not knowing ahead of time what routes were passable, where food, lodging, and fuel was available, whether there were local regulations or restrictions they had to worry about, or if state waivers had been granted, and if they were going to need to move through quickly and needed uh, some escort, some support, there was a lack of uh, ability to coordinate that ahead with the states. When I looked at it from a state perspective, I realized that it was two sides of the same coin. We have the same issues, only from the opposite direction. We, we need to know who's moving through the state, what they're moving as far as weight, uh, you know, size of the trucks, because there are times when waivers have to be granted. And the, the more advanced notice we have for that, so we can get that up uh, to the governor's office, the better. Um, they really appreciate when things aren't thrown at them last minute. Um, you know, government is a, a community. It, it, you have to get all the heads together and, and decide, is this going to happen? So most of those decisions aren't made lightly. And so it's always better to know ahead of time who's coming, what they're bringing, when they're going to be here. And so we can get uh, a lot of those issues worked out. Another issue created at the state level by fleets moving through sometimes is traffic backlogs. And if they're moving through an area, let's say they're going through Birmingham, Alabama, and typically you can run right through Birmingham, Alabama if you don't run into um, traffic construction, but there's interstate running all through Birmingham so you can run through there very quickly. But in a storm situation, if Birmingham was involved in the storm um, or is having some kind of other emergency situation, those interstate routes may not be open or they may be redirected and that can sometimes cause traffic backlogs. And if the fleet gets involved in that, that makes that problem even worse. So that was an issue from the state perspective. Um, there are state level regulations and there are local level restrictions. And sometimes those things don't work in conjunction with each other. So just because you have a state waiver doesn't necessarily mean um, you have everything you need to get through a local area or the local area might not be aware that the state waiver has been granted. So if we know that a fleet's coming, um, know where they're needing to go, we can track their route. We can let our local entities know, okay, you're gonna have this many trucks moving through your area at this time. There's a waiver, there's a weight waiver. Um, so they, you know, they will let them pass and, and that won't be a problem hopefully for anybody. And then advanced coordination, as I said before, of any kind of law enforcement that 
needed to for an escort so that they move through efficiently. Um, you know, that that's always helpful to work out ahead of time as well. Um, also, from a, a private sector liaison perspective, knowing if they're going to need fuel, lodging, and food, and where they're going to need those things, where they're planning to stop, so that they're going to need to fuel up and, and maybe spend the night, allows us to work with our private sector partners ahead of time to make sure that there's rooms available, gas stations open. You know, if they come through in the middle of the night, there's there may be a particular gas station that they need to use. So we can communicate all that information through the app and the fleet will know ahead of time and they're planning where they can go to do that. So that makes it very beneficial for us. Um, as I said, knowledge is the key. Knowing is half the battle. Anytime you can anticipate problems, they are more likely to be avoided. So we get those waivers issued, we get that advanced coordination done, we coordinate with the private sector um, because we've looked through the app and we know what's happening with the fleet. The fleet has looked through the app and knows what ha what's happening with the state. Another key component is being able to know bridge weight limits. The app will show bridge weight limits, which I think is fantastic. Um, our uh, people at the state level can load all that, and I think carrying them actually can pull that from information already available, have that in the app so when the fleets are planning, they know where there's going to be issues with bridges as far as weight limits and that type thing. So it just gives everybody information and, and key information, important information that we need to make it work for all involved. So one of the great things about this app is the opportunity for real-time data. Um, we can link our DOT department up with the folks with the app. When there are road closures, they can feed that right straight to the folks at the app that can be put into the tool, the application. And so that, that's updated as the fleet moves. So if there's something that happens along their route, they can see that and, and make a change on the fly. Um, such as it is with a large fleet, but that helps um, because we all know that after a disaster, the first focus, the immediate focus becomes getting care and resources to those in the affected areas. And the quicker you can do that and the, the, uh, with the most efficiency, the better. You, you may be saving lives, you may be getting people critical resources. So that's awesome. So now Carrie is going to give you a demo of this fantastic product, and I'm so excited to see it. So Carrie, take it away. Can you stop sharing your screen so I can take it over? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, ma'am, I can. All right. Thank you. And let me know when you see that. I see it. All right, perfect. So thanks for that introduction, Bethany, of, of what we're going to look at here and um, just the real importance behind something like this. So this is live, as Bethany mentioned. Um, the radar that you're seeing here is things that are going on right now. The purple lines that you see on here are just some routes that we have preloaded into this application. We found that they are the traditional north-south routes um, during a pretty big incident. They follow mainly interstates and, and heavier traveled roads. Um, so for the purpose of the demo today, uh, I wanted to call out those specific routes. So at the surface, this doesn't look like a whole lot. The real um, power behind this comes as you work and zoom in. So the idea is that, yep, I'm looking at this on a computer right now, but this can also work on a phone or a device. So your actual fleet drivers or your fleet teams that are moving have this information in their pocket. You can also have your logistics coordinator back in your office helping to plan. So one thing that we didn't really discuss is um, the challenge that we're all facing right now and that is COVID. And so along these routes, basically uh, what you're seeing here in the red that came up, so these are counties that are just crossing the purple routes. It's not just a whole mess of data. We only have data that is around one mile of the actual route. So it's not everything in the United States, it's simply around the route. And so that helps to refine when teams are out there. 
But as far as COVID, um, so the red are counties with high levels of COVID transmission right now. And then the other colors that you see down through here are areas where there may be um, less rates or less cases. And so as I zoom in, you start to see more information. And again, this is live. Um, some more information popped up as I, as I zoomed in. So that's traffic. That is live traffic as we speak. So men Bethany mentioned the traffic. I'm actually gonna turn those two layers off. So this is what is in this application. There's a lot. Um, I'm gonna turn the traffic off and the COVID just so that I can highlight some of these different areas. Um, so if we zoom in here around Charlotte, you'll start to see some additional information come in. So these are all of the facilities and gas stations and truck stops and rest areas and all of the things that a fleet might need to know as they're traveling. And again, with the COVID information in the background, you can see, hey, this county has a real high case rate or high spread. I don't know if I wanna stop there necessarily. So I may travel a little bit further to stop. Also, um, these are tying into a service through the All Hazards Consortium that tell us when they're open and closed. So that's running on basically their internet to say, yep, internet's working. So we're going to assume it's open or nope, it's not, it's closed. Um, so just a little bit of a way that, that we're looking at that. But one of the things, again, um, that's really super powerful behind this is when fleets are traveling down this road, for example, they may need to stop for gas. They may need to find lodging if they don't already have somebody that found that out for them. There's a tool in here called the Near Me tool. And if you're on a phone, you'll actually see your actual location on your phone and it'll automatically find anything around you. Because I'm on a desktop, I have to show you that by clicking. So basically the idea is I come in here and say my truck is on this road and I'm here. What it does, it gives me all of the facilities, all of the hotels, rest stops, and any other um, uh, features that are in near where I clicked. And so this is within five miles. I can change this to be more miles, which will give me more, or I can lower my radius, which will give me less. On the app, on the phone, it'll actually give you turn by turn driving um, directions to any one of these that you choose. So if I drill in here, you can see comfort suites, and then this actually has a link to their website, their phone number, et cetera. So you can get right to that information. Um, so one other thing, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention here is some of the different layers that we've got in here. Uh, so 511 road closures, this is a newer layer that we've got. This is a nationwide 511 um, traffic layer. So if I turn that on and kind of zoom out here, let's see, <clears throat> takes a second for this to load. And it's not like it, oh here, here's one. Um, so if I click on here, it tells me um, a, that a road has been closed, okay? So it could tell me why it's closed, when they expect it to be open, when it was last observed. I actually have this filter to only show me records today. If I didn't have that filter on, it would just be loaded with, with road closures. Um, but that's just one of the ways that the 511 data can benefit, um, as Bethany mentioned. And then we've got the just the state boundaries and the counties. We also have da disaster photos. So this is um, a layer a FEMA sponsored layer. Um, and if I turn this on and show you what that does, so it shows different areas um, that have disaster information. And so you can see along the way as these or as these photos and things come in, um, areas you might want to avoid. And then we have all the facilities, let I mention, hotels, gas stations, rest stops, et cetera. We have generator suppliers, hotels, wait station, way stations, um, all of the pilot travel centers, there's a whole plethora of information. And so again, the beauty behind this is you can start to layer information into this and actually track those fleet trucks. So as Bethany mentioned, as they get close to a border, for example, Alabama, you can have a two-way notification. Hey, Bethany, this truck and this fleet is getting very close to your border. And oh, hey, truck, you're getting very close to Alabama. Um, so you can start to have that two-way um, push and pull of information, which is really what makes it powerful. And you can also see the real-time location if you choose. It's not a requirement, but again, that's part of the power behind. So that's a real quick overview. This thing has a lot of data, um, but I don't want to take up too much more time here. I want to kick it back over to Bethany and finish up here and uh, have her finish through the slides.
All right, I unshared. I think you should be good, Bethany. Okay, here we go. So another um, important aspect of this from the state perspective is this is another tool which allows us to further enhance our relationships with the private sector. And that's twofold in this situation because we get to enhance our relationship with the fleets that are moving through. We get to build relationships with them and we get to build relationships with the private sector partners within the state that we reach out to to help accommodate these fleets. So it, it really gives us an opportunity to build some new relationships, to strengthen some existing ones, and to bring us all together, collaborating and communicating together, which in emergency management is, I, I mean, I, I just can't tell you the importance of that. Communication is so very important at, at all levels, top to bottom, side to side. We don't really have a top to bottom in an emergency situation, it's it's north, south, east, west. So all the communication that, that you can do is fantastic and allowing us to have other opportunities to communicate with our private partners really helps us further our programs and um, build those relationships. And that reaps dividends beyond just a fleet traveling through. You know, there are other things that that, that will uh, foster beyond just a disaster situation. So that's very important. And down here at the bottom, you will see to submit information to the response group during a disaster situation, you email fleetmove at fleetresponse.org. And that's how you can get your state's information or your even local area's information into the app. And we were supposed to have a, um, there it is. So that's really all Carrie and I have. We'll open it for questions and comments. This is our contact information if you have any questions after the presentation. I have really enjoyed working with this group. They are, they all have much bigger brains than mine and I love listening to them talk and work out these problems um, and issues and ideas. And as, as they work through conversations, somebody will come up with an idea and they'll ask the other one, hey, do you think that can work? And the first immediate answer might be no. And then the very next moment, they'll say, you know what? Yes, I think we can do that. So it has just been to be involved in the creative process with them has been outstanding. And I really appreciate them letting me um, invite myself into that. <laughs> Bethany, Carrie, thank you very much. Uh, one question that I have is, uh, what's the working relationship uh, that you have with the restaurant and lodging group? Do they inform you, for example, that uh, the restaurants are open, that they have vacancies at certain hotels? Is that available in the GIS tool as well? It's not yet. So this is a fairly new tool. We did test it out through Hurricanes Laura and Sally this past year. Um, that is one thing that we're looking to do. And I also have real-time interactivity. So if a, if a fleet knows a hotel is full, you know, they call them and they say it's full, um, we're building in the ability for them to choose that hotel and have some mechanism to report, hey, it's full, so that the fleet coming behind them can also see. So right now, today, it's not. Um, but again, that's kind of on our docket for next phase, if you will, um, to, to really make this a lot more powerful so that you can truly see open close. I did mention the open close um, with the um, credit card or the internet. Um, so that's a limited number of facilities at this point. Um, so that is an option, but it doesn't cover everything. Um, so again, we're looking at additional options in a different way, additional ways. And that's one of the things the work group is addressing moving forward. Great, thank you. And Bethany, is it challenging to get law enforcement at the local and the state level to all be on the same sheet of music, if you will, when it comes to restrictions and, and, and those kinds of issues? Well, now, George, I feel like that's a loaded question <laughs> <laughs> because uh, we, we have a very good relationship with our law enforcement here in Alabama. We have uh, what's called the Alabama Law Enforcement Agency, 
which encompasses a lot of different uh, sectors of law enforcement. And we have an outstanding relationship with them. And they in turn have a very good relationship with the local level law enforcement. So we tend to work through our state partner and then they work down to the local level. But our emergency managers in our counties do have good relationships with our local law enforcement. So from the Alabama perspective, I would say, no, it is usually not a challenge. It's only a challenge when they have 5,000 things going on in their area and um, you know, getting their ear for a minute might be a challenge, but getting them on board with something tends not to be a challenge here in my state. Thank you. We have a question, uh, Tom Moran asks, uh, Bethany, what type of actions can a state take to help fleets avoid delays during fleet movements during disasters? Well, I discovered during this uh, process that one of the big things they need to know is when those waivers are granted, um, the, the restriction waivers. It's very helpful to them to know when those waivers have been issued, because a lot of times in a disaster, you are moving heavier loads because you're, you're trying to get more resources to an area quicker. So you're, you're loading up trucks with as much as you can. And sometimes um, they are over the limit. And I believe states have different limits. So you might be under the limit in Georgia, but over the limit in Alabama. That's something they know, but you know we don't necessarily know how much they're hauling through. So one of the big things is from the state level, getting that waiver information communicated to them. And also, like Carrie said, right now, the, the restaurant and hotel piece is not uh, completely built out. Well, in the meantime, what I can do is if I know a fleet is coming and I know that they need to uh, take a break overnight or are going to need to stop for food or fuel, I can reach out to those areas, to our partners in those areas and find that information out and communicate it until we can get a direct feed of that information. Great. Uh, you know, one issue that keeps coming up time and time again is, is the, the, the issue of trust. Working closely and, and working a, a partnership between the private and public sector, you know, what really comes out is we all know 85% of the country's critical infrastructure and key resources are owned or operated by the private sector. For the government to do their job effectively, they need to know that the water is still running, electricity is still working in, in, in order to have the community continue to, to recover from a disaster. So I think what you guys bring out is just an excellent example of, of that collaborative effort to, to help the community thrive essentially in, in spite of all disasters that, uh, that, that gets thrown our way. So kudos to the both of you and, and, and thank you very much for sharing your, your knowledge and and expertise in this in this field. I, I see this app growing, you know, further and further as you evolve. And 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 I think I think your input and the private sector's input is going to help make it even better. Gary, I know this is John Molnar speaking here. Uh, I know you had a lot on that demo. Uh, could you just uh, and I wrote down several that that I could remember, and some you probably didn't even show. You, you had rest stops. You had the disaster assessment pictures. You had road closures, uh, the bridge, the bridge uh, weight issues. Uh, I'm not. It, we we even had the COVID areas and the uh, sort of the hot hot areas of COVID uh, that was that were mapped out. I, I don't know if I did if I missed it or or uh, you didn't show that one. I mean that that could be a key area to decide where you stop in regards to COVID types of activities. Uh, are, and I know that, that uh, and I'll talk about the next one here in a second, but what, what others did I miss regarding those, those data sets that, uh, that are on that map? Yeah, so I think you hit it. Um, I did talk about the COVID hotspots a little bit to talk about the cases um, in that particular county right along the route. Um, and that is key, you know, as far as, hey, I may want to stop here versus I want to stop 100 miles down the road. Um, the bridge inventory, as Bethany mentioned, is a big one. So that's tunnel heights, uh, you know, bridge heights, bridge weights, uh, weight limits, and things like that. So we have that. 
Um, we have PPE suppliers. Um, I mentioned several um, hospitals, a lot of the truck stops, so Flying J, Racetrack, Speedway, um, travel centers, rest stops, way stations, generator suppliers, all different kinds of facilities. So that included food, fuel, pharmacies, um, big box stores, so like Lowe's and Home Depot and things like that. Um, the damage photos and the 511. So those are the big ones. And then some of the other stuff that's in there that's kind of supporting, if you will, is the weather. Um, so I mentioned the radar. We also have watches, warnings, and advisories. Um, and again, as you start to layer in the tracking of those fleets, you can start to have intelligent notifications back and forth. Hey, there's you know, a severe thunderstorm within five miles of you, or there's a tornado warning on the road in front of you, or, or you know, things like that. You can start to have um, just a little bit more power behind just driving down the road. Yeah, and I think some of that, and, and there's probably a hundred more that we're not even thinking about, because I don't even think we have electric outages in that at this point in time. We, we don't have that, right, Carrie? Nope. <laughs> we don't have that in corporate. I mean, those are some of the basic things that you would you would just think. Uh, one of the areas that, that that Terry spoke about is an open closed uh, facility. We've been working on that for years. Uh, we are using current data with used network systems at this point in time uh, that has probably, I think that the total is around 100,000 locations across the nation uh, within the food, the fuel, the lodging and the pharmacies uh, that are in that. We're trying. And, and it, and it kind of, I just want to take two minutes to try to allow you to understand how difficult uh, without this collaboration, without trust, we don't get this type of data. Uh, used network systems allowed us uh, to see their data through their uh, network outage uh, charts. Uh, so again, it's a trust factor that they, that they provided. We are trying to get the bank data and what we're trying to do is, as uh, Carrie mentioned, is credit card data. And, and it starts, it sounds easy, but can you imagine asking a bank for their credit card information? I mean, they, they basically just walk away without, without even, you know, without giving us a, a chance. Uh, but without trust, if, if we, you know, we have found some people, we've almost had it, and people have left within that environment. But the, the, the credit card information would be critical to hit, you know, I don't know how many millions of areas that we would have open and closed within each of the given types of stores that could be relative uh, to, to your map that you are looking for, whether it's, you know, the basics of food, lodging, fuel, uh, and pharmacies, that type of stuff, but also other types of information as well. Now, how they'll trust us with that, um, how they will the, deal with that information, uh, what will they give us to that. They just don't hand you that without some type of, uh, of uh, you know, sifting that goes through uh, to make sure that that data is, is safe to carry and, and put that out there. But these are the issues that this network brings and that trust factor brings to allow such things to occur. So, you know, George, Bethany, Carrie, I don't know if you have any comments on that, but that is really the key of why something like this could be developed uh, across the map. Yeah, we can work on that from our end at the state level. For instance, in Alabama, we have the Alabama Bankers Association, which is an outstanding group and they, they have their act together. I'm just going to put it that way. And we could, you know, speak to them about a trial. Hey, let's, let's do a trial with the fleet group and see how that goes. And then if that works, we can build it out from there. We can bring in other states and say, Hey, we've tested this, you know, our, our bankers are, are good with it and it's working and um, just use it as a model for other states. We have to start small. Um, because again, like you said, it is a trust thing. And we are learning from the government side that we have to trust the private sector more. We have to open things to the private sector. And so that is allowing us to 
start some new relationships, enhance some relationships, broaden some relationships that we already have, and let the private sector know, hey, we're, we're going to let go of those tight reins that we've held on trust for a while and, and you know, work to, to really have a collaborative environment more so. A lot of times from the government end, it's we want all this information from you, the private sector, but we're not going to give you our information because it's proprietary, because we're the government. And, but it's really their information. I mean, they've given it to us and we've just put it into a new package and put a different bow on it. So um, it's an interesting dynamic, but I think if we start small and, and build it out, that's something that we can help with from our side. Bethany, let me ask the question a little differently. How do you, as, as a government organization, get to have the private sector trust the government? <laughs> How do you get them to, to kind of open up and, and, you know, risk the fear of, you know, exposing too much information? After all, you know, some of the government agencies are regulators and, 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 and can they trust the government and is their data secure? How do you, how do you break that barrier to encourage that, that partnership? Well, again, we start small. In our state EOC, we have what we call EMCs, which are emergency management coordinators from not only other state agencies, but private entities as well. Our big utility companies, um, our nonprofit organizations, um, airports, di different sectors that are involved in emergency management, wireless communication. Um, they all have a representative that uh, is assigned to our EOC. And we, we start with building a relationship with them. And then they take that back to their organization and say, hey, this, this is a really good thing. These are good people. Um, we're, we're getting things done. And it doesn't the wheels don't always turn as quickly as you want them to, um, but they're turning and we are building relationships and really trying to foster collaboration. And so it's, we, we take, interestingly enough, a lot of trust is built during a disaster because you just don't have any other choice but to, to trust and, and run with things sometimes. Um, but we are learning on a government side to reach out more to the private sector to help us solve problems. And as we bring them in to do that, it really does reinforce trust and build trust. And we just have to do a little bit better job of that from our side of the table. It really comes down to relationship, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. You know, one of the things that Tom uh, Moran and I talk a lot about is you know, as administrations change within state government, you know, maybe every four years or eight years or, or whatever, you get a new governor, different marching orders. How do you, how do you maintain or sustain something, something as much as, as you've built upon? So it, it sort of outlasts an administration if it really truly has, has benefits. Well, for instance, with this private sector program, this really should be driven by the private sector. This should be their program, and like this fleet application. The, the, the primary benefit of this is for the fleets. It helps them with their planning. We get to reap benefit from that as well, but with our programs at the state level, my program in particular, when you let the private sector really have a, a huge part in it and it, it kind of be their program, it's hard for government to change it. We're just there as, as in a support role. We're not the league, you know, we're, we're just here to help the private sector coordinate among themselves and with government to get things done in a disaster. Um, so that particular program, because it would be, uh, more focused and, and run by non-government entities, it, it could just roll right on. Now, there are other programs that, of course, we have to um, be flexible and adapt as administrations change, and that sometimes delays things, stalls things. Um, that's just, we can't help that. But if we have a program that's working, we just fight really hard to, to keep that going. We may have to change some of the dynamics of it, but 
we just have to fight to keep that going. And sometimes that involves getting some non-government entities involved and saying, hey, you know, this program is working. Let, let's don't trash it or file 13 it. Let's tweak it and, and move on with it so that we don't lose the progress that we've made. And, and that's excellent. I, I can't think of a better segue for this next session. The Endeavor Working Group has really come up with the same same response that you just uh, articulated, Bethany. So again, Carrie, Bethany, thank you so much for, for taking the time to share with the group this, this very productive and, and useful app. Uh, best of luck to both of you in the, in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.